For those who haven't been with us for a while, we are nearing the end of our series in Genesis. We've got, uh, I think, three more weeks to go. We've been going through the book of Genesis and looking at the character of Jacob, a man who was flawed and yet chosen and used by God. And we're in uh, Genesis chapter 33 this morning. So if you could turn in your your Bibles to Genesis 33, that would be fantastic. What we're going to do is just going to read through the passage. It's a fair chunk. Then I'm going to pray and then we're going to uh, dive straight into it. It'd be great if you could... Uh, Follow along if you have your Bibles with you. Genesis chapter 33. Let's read it uh, together. Verse 1 begins, And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau was coming with 400 men with him. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and two female servants. And he put the servants with their children in front, and then Leah and her children, and Rachel and Joseph, his favorite son, last of all. So if something kicked off, they could get away. He himself went on before them, bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. And when Esau lifted up his eyes and he saw the woman and the children, he said, Who are these with you? And Jacob said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the servants drew near, they and their children, and they bowed down. Leah likewise and her children drew near, and they too bowed down. And last Joseph and Rachel drew near, and they bowed down. And Esau said, What do you mean by all this company that I met? Jacob answered, To find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. So Jacob said, No, 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 please. If I have found favor in your sight, then accept my present from my hand. For I have seen your face, which is like seeing the face of God, and you have accepted me. Please accept my blessing that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me and because I have enough. Thus he urged him and he took it. Then Esau said, let us journey on our way and I will go ahead of you. But Jacob said to him, my Lord knows that the children are frail and that the nursing flocks and herds are a care to me. If they're driven too hard one day, all the flocks will die. Let my Lord pass on ahead of his servant and I will lead on slowly at the pace of the livestock that are ahead of me and at the pace of the children, until I come to my Lord in Seir. I don't claim to know how to pronounce all these words accurately, so bear with me if you do. So Esau said, let me leave with you some of the people who are with me, verse 15. But he said, what need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir. But Jacob journeyed to Sukkoth and built himself a house and made booths for his livestock. Therefore, the name of the place is called Sukkoth, which means booths. Thanks, that's very helpful. And Jacob came safely to the city of Sheshem, which is in the land of Canaan on his way from Padan Aram, and he camped before the city. And from the sons of Hamor, Sheshem's father, he bought for a hundred pieces of money the piece of land on which he had pitched his tent. There he erected an altar and called it El Elohi Israel. Let's pray. Lord, we, we love to worship you. We love to come before you and and and, and uh, sing your praises, Lord. And as we, as we look at your word right now, we pray that this story thousands of years ago, uh, that you would open it up to us, that you'd open our hearts and instruct us and help us as we delve into this great story of, of reconciliation. Amen. Amen. The main plot going on in this chapter is that of reconciliation between Jacob and Esau, between a younger swindling brother and his older brother Esau. Okay, and that's what we're focusing on this morning. We're focusing on the issue of reconciliation because that from this chapter is a, is a key thing that emerges. And when I speak about reconciliation, what I'm talking about is the coming together of two people across sin and across differences and not holding differences with one another to the extent that it separates and fractures the relationship. So that's where we're going this morning. And reconciliation is a significant issue for all of us. There's one guarantee I can give you this morning is that you will all face situations in your life where you need to face up to reconciliation, okay? It's something that's going to live with us all the time. It's a significant and important issue in the church, particularly between Christians. The Christian is compelled to seek reconciliation with anyone they have a fractured relationship with. We see in in Matthew 5, verse 23 and 24, this striking command from Jesus. It should come up on the screen any minute, Matthew 5, 23 and 24, Jesus says, so if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before you go to the altar, leave your gift there, go first be reconciled 
to your brother and then come and offer your gift. So what he's saying is before you come to worship, it looked like offering gifts at the altar then, make sure you are reconciled to your brother. Interestingly, in those few verses, is not necessarily putting the weights on the guilty party. Can you notice that? I found that surprising. It's saying, if you become aware that you are at difference with your brother, go and make sure that you're reconciled first, whether you're the innocent or the guilty party. Obviously, the weight probably often falls on the guilty party, but there's probably guilt on both sides. So the Christian is compelled by Scripture. We're compelled by the love of God as well, because reconciliation, us reconciling, is an extension, actually, of God's love towards us and what God has done towards us. But it's obviously not just between Christians or just within the church. In uh, Romans 12, 18, Paul, writing to the Romans, he says, if at all possible, so as long as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Now, you're not going to live at peace with people unless you've been reconciled. If there's a separation or a fracture in the relationship, you're not going to live at peace with people. So I I know it's kind of like a straight in beginning, but this issue of reconciliation is fundamental to the health of the church and actually the witness of the church. But it's not just a significant issue for us as Christians, as it were. It's a huge issue out in the world, outside the church, as it were. You just need to watch the news or do a bit of a Google search, and you'll realize that the word reconciliation is used very often. I did a bit of a Google search on celebrity reconciliation, and whether it's Ashley and and Cheryl Cole, as they've gone through their difficulties recently, Lewis Hamilton and Nicole Scherzinger, one of the pussycat dolls, don't know anything about them, you might, Uh, between Tiger Woods and his wife recently, huge issues, between the late Stephen Gately and his mother, and when I last preached, we heard from that great philosopher Mariah Carey, some of you will remember that, this morning we're going to have a little bit of help from Sandra Bullock, because just recently she's been in the news about a potential split with her husband, Jesse James. When I Google that, if you look for the headlines, the very word they use is reconciliation. It's a hugely important, important word. Why? Why is it to the church, we can understand maybe to some extent, but why is it an important word or important aspect of life to people outside the church? Well, a guy called David Brooks, who's a secular columnist who writes for the New York Times, he wrote this. He wrote an article entitled, The Sandra Bullock Trade. And he says, two things happened to Sandra Bullock. She's my favorite female actor. Anyone else in the house? One or two. I didn't see any men put their hands up. (laughs) Sorry. Okay. It's because she does movies with guns and she's quite tough. No, she's very feminine and uh, beautiful, let's say. I'll stop there. He says, I did tell my wife that. Love you, honey. Two things happened to Sandra Bullock this month, David Brooks right, and he's talking about last month. First, she won an Academy Award for Best Actress. That's pretty good. Then came the news reports claiming that her husband is an adulterous jerk. So the philosophic question of the day is, and this is in the article, would you take that as a deal? Would you exchange a tremendous personal, professional triumph for a severe personal blow? That's the question he asked in this article. Would you take a professional triumph for a severe personal blow? And he goes on, he says, on the one hand, an Academy Award is nothing to sneer at. Bullock has earned the respect and admiration of her peers in a way very few experience. She'll make money for years to come. And actually, she may even live longer. Research has shown that Academy Award winners live about four years longer than uh, nominees. So she's doing quite well. So if you want to live four years more, There you go, interesting stat of the day. He goes on to say in a secular columnist, he says, nevertheless, nonetheless, if you had to take more than three seconds to think about that question, you're absolutely crazy. And he's right. Marital happiness is far more important than anything else in determining personal well-being. If you have a successful marriage, it doesn't matter how many professional setbacks you endure, you will be reasonably happy. And he says this isn't sermonizing, and he quotes research that he's had. If you have an unsuccessful marriage, it doesn't matter how many career triumphs you record, you will remain significantly unfulfilled. And he goes on, he quotes the research, and he finishes with this. He says, the overall impression from this research is that economic and professional success exists on the surface of life, excuse me, and that they emerge out of interpersonal relationships which are much deeper and much more important. I think he's right. 
It's a huge issue, reconciliation, for those who would not even call themselves believers. It has a huge impact on personal well-being, on one's happiness. He quotes research on happiness studies. How you do that, I'm not entirely sure. But whether it's inside the church or outside, reconciliation is a fundamental thing that we all have to deal with. And ultimately, obviously, the big question is, are we reconciled with God? Because that doesn't have implications for just our well-being in this life. It has in- eternal implications. Because if there is a, a severing or a separation in a relationship with God, which there is, as we'll see, it has severe implications. And the reason we're always going to face issues of reconciliation is why? It's because of the issue of sin, because of the issue of wrongdoing in the world. Right at the beginning of creation, Adam and Eve, husband and wife, in perfect harmony. It does happen. Still today, I'm told. We, we're, we're there, honey. We're learning a lot. But Adam and Eve lived in perfect harmony until sin entered the world, until they wronged each other. And from that point, there was a separation on the, ver- on the horizontal between man and man, and there was a separation between man and God. Adam blames God, and he blames Eve. The woman you gave me, the woman, he doesn't take responsibility. Ever since then, and until Christ returns and we have a new heavens and a new earth, there's going to be sin present, which means reconciliation is going to be an issue we must all face. So I guess the big question then, which we'll begin to look at from Scripture, is how and uh, how do we go about reconciliation? What, what are the steps that we need to take? And it won't be exhaustive, but the story of Jacob and Esau have a lot to teach us. And when I was preparing, I fell into the trap that preachers do of preparing it for somebody else. You know, preachers fall into that trap. We, we're prepared to, to speak to other people and we don't prepare to listen to this stuff for ourselves. And as a listener, we can do that. We can prepare to listen how it applies to the person in the seat next to us. We're very good at that. But actually, sometimes we need to own it a bit more. So can I encourage you to just open your hearts up and and own this as God speaks to us. So I've got four points for you this morning. Value for your money. One more than you normally get here. Okay. And uh, we're going to walk through the passages and see a few principles that we draw out about how we can go about reconciliation. The first, and they're very simple and obvious, but they're necessary. The first is that reconciliation requires courageous initiation courageous initiation. We see in verse 1, it reads this. It says, Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, Esau was coming and 400 men with them. So he divided the children and Leah and Rachel and the servants and he sorted out the order. And then it says in verse 3, he himself went on before them. The very reason Jacob had got to this point was that God had told him to go back to his homeland. If you've been following the story, he had left Esau because Esau was uttering murderous death threats against him. And now God had said, return to your homeland. God hadn't explicitly said, go and reconcile with Esau. He had just said, go back to your homeland. So theoretically, Jacob could have tiptoed around the issue for years. He could have moved back to the homeland and he could have just avoided Esau, made sure he was the other side of the valley or behind the mountain. He could have done the pleasantries, waved to Esau across the valley, sent messengers. He could have skirted around the issue and given the illusion of unity. He could have been in the same church as Esau and just never chatted to him and kept him just, he could have been in the same staff room sitting across the opposite seat. And I know staff rooms are a great place for conflicts, being in one myself. He could have been in the same peer group, but never addressed the issue. But he knew that wasn't a viable option for him or his family. And it's not really a viable option. Sadly, so many of us, me included, we, we skirt around the issue for so long instead of going straight for the issue. Jacob realized that wasn't a viable option. Okay? For him or his family. He'd got a family now. He wanted them to know that their uncle and the other side of the family. When the author mentions that Esau was coming with 400 men, he's not just fleshing out the story. My mother moved, uh, she came over from Zimbabwe recently, and she gave me all my letters of when I wrote from the age of 7 to 12. And they're just full of absolute nonsense. The, the sky is blue, the dog is walking past mom, and I'm thinking of you. There's a lion outside, or there's a, there's a snake across the floor or something. It's just not quite those. But there was just random information. And in books today, we find random information. When these guys wrote, everything was to draw our attention to something. So obviously naming the 400 men is clearly drawing our attention to the potential danger and atmosphere there is there. Jacob has reason to be concerned. The last time he saw Esau was when Esau was uttering death threats. You come back, I'll kill you. And he was on the run. He's got reason to be concerned. Just because God tells us to do something doesn't make it easy, does it? 
I think we've all probably experienced it. Just because God's command is there doesn't make it easy. Jacob splits his family up and he takes caution. He puts the favorites at the back. But interestingly, Jacob puts himself at the front. Verse 3, the beginning. He himself went on before them. This was an issue that he had to deal with. This was an issue between him and his brother. He had used gifts and he had used friends to soften things up as we might do. When we've wronged someone, we might send them a text or sound out with our friends whether they still actually are angry with us. We might get on Facebook, which is kind of a neutral thing. You don't really have to engage. We might soften each other up and and check out the ground. But there comes a time after we've done the pleasantries, which we can keep doing for ages, there comes a time when we need to courageously lead into this thing and initiate some form of, of reconciliation. For Jacob, there's no escaping it now. To move on with his life, he must approach Esau. If he hadn't, he would have been looking over his shoulder the rest of his life, okay? He would have been looking over his shoulder the rest of his life if he hadn't done it. It's a little bit like marriage, okay? I, I'm just getting my toes wet uh, with regards to marriage. Just married a year now, but the first thing I've learned is that there's a heck of a lot to learn. But secondly is that if you allow small things, small irritations and small misunderstandings to go without addressing them, and without seeking reconciliation straight away, they keep popping up. It's like looking over your shoulder. You wonder when they're going to merge next. And it comes out in an anarchy joke, or in in my case, if I don't let my wife know how I'm feeling, I suddenly blow up one day, and I wonder, why have I blown up? Simply because forgiveness and repentance and reconciliation are not a daily practice. They have to be in the home. Otherwise, it's just going to fester. The Bible warns us, actually, in Hebrews 12, that we are not to allow a root of bitterness to grow up in us. And bitterness, when we're angry or irritated with someone, whether it's friendship, whether it's marriage, or whether it's professional relationship, if these things are not courageously initiated and met straight on, they fester and they affect the rest of our our relationship. An interesting question is, was Jacob guaranteed successful reconciliation? Was, did, did he have any guarantee that his reconciliation would be successful? God had promised him to go back to his country and that God would do him good. He said, go back, I'm going to do you good. Does that mean Esau was definitely going to respond kindly? Are there any guarantees for that? No. He's been compelled to initiate reconciliation, but he's got no guarantee that the other person is going to respond positively to him. Mark Driscoll preaching on this. He says, I can't guarantee you success from this story, but we can guarantee you hope. Two brothers, 20 years of separation, murderous death threats. There is hope, but there's no guarantee. This has been a a very very real issue for us as a family just in this last year. Um, My wife's father, uh, since early childhood, he hasn't really been an active part of the, the family, and there's been distance between the family and him, and we felt compelled in the last year to reconcile with him. We're, we're keen for our, our kids, God willing, that we have them one day to, to know, uh, know a grandfather. And we're also compelled because it's an opportunity for the gospel. And so we've, uh, uh, praise God, we, we've taken some steps and, and he has as well. He's, a, he's not a believer, just like Esau, Jacob believer, Esau not. He's taken some steps and we are getting there. There's a, there's a form of, and we spent around the Christmas period, we spent a bit of a day with him and, and his, his third family that he's got now. So it's been difficult and there's many parties and it's not easy. We aren't guaranteed that we're not going to get hurt again. And it's been particularly difficult for my wife after years of hurts and, and uh, potential attempts at this. But we are compelled by God's love to do this thing. We are compelled for our sake as well, for our health as well-beings and our interpersonal relationships to, to, to seek out that reconciliation. The thing is with reconciliation, we can wait for the perfect moment, can't we? We can weigh things up and we can wait around until we think the stakes are low, until we think they're in a good mood, until we, we see that we think there's going to be a positive step taken. If you wait for that, it may never come. And I I think I just felt from God to to press into this. You can't wait and let it linger and wait for the perfect moment because it's it's not going to come in again. It might possibly, it may be years, 20 years. Who wants to wait that long? Some in this room may have waited 20 years already 
through a fractured relationship with a brother or a, or a sister or, or a friend or a family member. If you're not a Christian as well, this is just as vital that it's something you initiate because as we saw, it, it affects our personal sense of, of well-being. So it takes courageous initiation. It takes a lot of strength, and my encouragement this morning is that, is that we would do that. If there are people in this room, in fact, we come to, we come to break bread at the end of this morning, and the Bible is, is scaringly encouraging sometimes. It says that we need to examine ourselves before we come and we break bread and remember all that Jesus has done for us. It says that we need to examine ourselves, and part of that is if we know that we are at odds with someone, we need to go and sort it out. I heard a, a story recently, I think maybe you told it a few weeks ago, of two people that, that just didn't feel they could come quickly and take the Lord's up until they had reconciled. And so they did that glorious reconciliation. It, it might not be possible here this morning. It might be a phone call when we leave here this morning. But can I compel you, as, as, as the Bible does, to seek out reconciliation here this morning? So it takes courageous initiation, but that's not enough. Because if you do that in the wrong manner, it's not going to lead anywhere. How you do it is just as important. And we see, secondly, then, reconciliation requires humility. Reconciliation requires humility. And we see this in verse 3. And Jacob is going to Esau, and he says, he himself went on before them, bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. Beginning of verse 4, but Esau ran to meet him. If we can have the next slide up, that'd be great. Esau ran to meet him. It's important to remember here, and this is what struck me. Jacob has been promised by God that Esau will serve him. Jacob has been promised by God that he will be a successful nation and that actually he will be, as it were, the winner over, over Esau. It's important to mention that because Jacob has reason to be on his high horse, doesn't he? He has reason to think, well, the birthright was mine anyway, or, or the blessing was mine anyway, all I did was just do what God had promised me. But Jacob positions himself. He bows down seven times. In that day, men would not run. Okay, how times have changed. Men would not run in those days. Children would run. Men were proud and, and possibly quite arrogant. Children would run. And bowing down was the way you met royalty in those days. So Jacob is positioning himself very humbly. Not in a haughty manner. If you're anything like me, when I approach someone over an issue of reconciliation, I am very slimy, or I can be. God's been gracious. I use my words very wisely. I don't know if you can uh, uh, sympathize, not the word, understand what I'm saying, is I will go to someone and apologize, but very carefully with my words. Really what I'm doing is I'm trying to elicit an apology from the other person. Yeah? Are you, does that resonate? It's like, so again, uh, we do have a great marriage, by the way. Just a, a few examples. <laughs> we have a wonderful marriage. Just a few examples. Is I, can, I can go to my wife and okay, darling, I'm so sorry you feel angry with me. Or I'm so sorry you, you reacted that way to what I said. Or think, it's despicable and it's slimy, isn't it? And what I'm really trying to do is wait for her to say, don't worry, darling, I overreacted. It's actually okay. When all I should be doing is Jacob humbling myself and owning my sin. Jacob could have been very slimy towards Esau. So you get, Esau, I'm so sorry that you gave up your birthright for a bowl of soup. I'm so sorry I took advantage of your hunger and your willingness to give me your birthright. I'm so sorry that father gave me your blessing. I'm so sorry that I got the blessing before you. He could have been very slimy and tricky, and sadly, that's so true. We laugh about it, okay, because it's real, but it's so true of us. Jacob owned his sin. This is the point. He owned his sin. He wasn't trying to elicit an apology. He wasn't drawing attention to the other person's faults. Okay, there were faults. Esau had been stupid to give away his birthright for a bowl of soup. There, there were faults there. It's no good to courageously initiate if we don't do it in the right attitude. It's not about drawing attention to the other person's fault. Fascinating for me is Esau, who I guess we could call the innocent party in this, he humbles himself as well. Verse, beginning of verse 4, it says, Esau ran to meet him. And as I said, men didn't run in that culture. It's not only Jacob who displays humility, the guilty party, it's also the innocent party who shows humility. I find that, I find that fascinating. 
It's not just an acceptance. It's I'm humbling myself. Esau had one thing in mind. What do you think Esau had in mind? 20 years of separation with my brother. I want to embrace him. I want to be with him. There was one thing driving Esau, and that was reconciliation with his brother. If I was Esau, sorry, I, I stepped on. Esau humbles himself. What would people think? What would people think? You are a sucker for punishment. Have you ever been told that? Don't go and be friends with that person again. They're just going to hurt you again. Just as Jacob had no uh, guarantees that, uh, that Esau will, wouldn't hurt him, Esau had no guarantees that Jacob wouldn't hurt him again. He would have been justified, I suggest, in maintaining his dignity and making Jacob grovel. Would you agree? Maybe not. He would have been justified in standing there. Come on, Jacob. I'm here. This is your chance to apologize. But to him, restored relationship was far more important than professional dignity or anything else. He wanted the relationship above pride and above reputationism and above kind of dignity or other people's opinions. The thing is, just when it comes to the place where humility is needed, pride rears its head. As, as elders, we often work with people who are at difference with each other or, or, or with us, and this is what it comes to. It always comes to this, whether the person owns their sin. Of course, the other parties often have faults. Of course, it's both two-sided. There's, there's cause and there's effect. But often when it comes to it, people either try to squirm out of it and blame the other spouse or blame the other person or blame this or blame that. And some just say, yes, I was wrong. Of course the other person's done some wrong. It comes to owning sin humbly, as Jacob did. And interestingly, Esau needed to humble himself and have the right attitude for that reconciliation to take place. So not only is courageous initiation needed, okay, and not only is humility needed, but thirdly, we see that reconciliation requires forgiveness, which is fundamental. We think that interest, it's not just acceptance. You're not going to get full reconciliation, I don't believe, if there's just acceptance of an apology. There has to be forthright, total, uninhibited forgiveness. We see this in, in verse 4 again. Esau ran to him and met to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. I find it fascinating that Esau didn't even give time for an apology. I, I wouldn't have done it. Now, Jacob has kind of apologized with his gifts and sending people ahead of him. He's made forms of But Esau doesn't even wait for an apology. He doesn't even demand an apology. I would have said, as I said, you wronged me, Jacob. Now's your time to apologize. When you do that, Jacob, we can move on. Are we not the same, particularly, if we're the innocent party or the innocent party? We wait for the other person to to repent or the other person to say sorry before we are willing to forgive. Esau doesn't hesitate. He runs and he embraces and he kisses him before a word is spoken. Esau seizes the opportunity for reconciliation. This isn't begrudging acceptance. I'm guilty of that when someone apologizing, begrudging acceptance. It's total forgiveness. Jacob goes on and he hurts Esau again. He deceives him at the end of the chapter. I don't know if you were aware of it when he read Esau says, let's go to Seir, okay? And Jacob says, oh, I'm going to come there. Let me just take a leisurely pace, okay? But he's, he's messing him around again because he doesn't go to Seir. He settles in Sukkoth. He builds a home and he builds booths. In fact, the next time we see in the Bible that they meet again is at their father's death. Esau's done everything. Esau's forgiven and Jacob still doesn't actually follow through on his word. He gets hurt again, I, I, I would suggest. Maybe this morning you are the innocent party and you're waiting for the other person to initiate that reconciliation. Okay? It might never come. I, I, I faced this with my, uh, <clears throat> with my, with my father. Uh, I got home from my GCSEs when I was 16 and my father had disappeared. Kind of no one knew where he was for a while. Uh, he had been drinking for a few years, alcoholism, and he had taken himself off to a, a detox clinic. Uh, sadly, that didn't work. And for the next five years, he w flitted in and out of the picture. We didn't know where he was half the time, occasionally some contact. And I was waiting, a young guy, I was waiting for my dad to come home and apologize. And it's hard. I mean, even today, it's difficult 
when you think about it, I was waiting for my dad to come home and apologize for the hurt he had caused, the, the way he had let us down and stuff. But uh, various things in the nature of alcoholism, if you know anything about it, he just didn't see that. And actually, I got to the age of about 21, and I, 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 was, I guess there was a root of bitterness coming up in my life, and there was a, a, I, I just, I, that re- relationship was separate between my family and my dad. And I, I, I felt compelled, and with some counsel from someone else who'd been through the same thing, to write a letter of forgiveness to my father, which seems a bit weird, because at that stage, there was no hope that I would ever receive that, that he would ever actually come and apologize. And my, my sister found it extremely difficult. She's not a Christian, so she didn't have God's love to do that. She couldn't even face up to, to connecting with him. And understandably, my mother, who had been through a lot, couldn't as well. And I, I had to forgive my father without any guarantee of anything back. Now, I don't say that to, to big myself up, but because that's the situation many of us will be in. Many of us will have to initiate some form of reconciliation with, and forgive someone who might not return the same attitude or the same thing of heart. We are compelled to, to forgive because, yes, it's God's command, but also because God knows that's what's best for us, as, as the world's research shows, shows a sense of personal well-being. And, you know, one of the reasons, and I'll come back to this later, so i make this point now. One of the reasons he struggled with it was the sense of guilt. Often because of guilt, people can't accept or give forgiveness. Because we can't think, oh, they're never going to accept my apology. I can't face up to my sin. Or how can you forgive me? I've been so bad. Interestingly, this picture that, uh, of Esau running and meeting Jacob is the same picture that Jesus used when he, thousands of years later in the parable of the, the lost son. In Luke chapter 15, we, we see the same picture. Jesus tells a, a parable about a father who had two sons, a younger and an older most will know it if they've uh, been to Sunday school. A younger and older son. The younger son gets irritant. He gets uh, a bit petulant or he gets itchy feet and he says, give me my inheritance now. He goes off while father and older son are working, spends his money, goes to the prostitutes, goes to the movies, gets a flash car, uh, a recession hits, finds himself in debt and the, a famine hits the land and the story and he ends up getting a job feeding pigs. Okay, and after time he can't even afford food so what does he do? He eats the food of the of the pigs. And he comes to his senses. He says, I can't be my father's son anymore because I've messed him around, but I can go back and be one of his servants. They get paid quite well. And so he goes back to, goes back to his father with these prepared speech, I'm not worthy to be your son. Treat me as a servant. And it says this in verse 20 of Luke 15. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. It's the same picture of Esau receiving Jacob. And the commentators will say it, it, Jesus was probably using this picture. But the, the son couldn't accept it. He said, no, no, no. I'm not worthy to be a son. Treat me as a... The father was forgiving him. The father was embracing him. But the son, I, I think, was riddled with guilt. He couldn't understand why the father could just forgive him. And so he, he struggled to fully accept that forgiveness. I think the same thing happens with Jacob and, and Esau. I can't say that explicitly. I think the reason Jacob doesn't receive Esau's invitation and eventually go and connect with him is Jacob struggles to understand how Esau can unreservedly forgive him. But I, I, admittedly, that's my thinking, but I think there's something there. And I felt very specifically this morning the weight of guilt is a specific stumbling block to relationships in this room that need reconciling. I've been there before. I've thought, they're never going to forgive me, or I've been forgiven by someone I've hurt, and I've taken ages to get over it. Until I've got over it, that relationship is not restored. Guilt can hinder us initiating reconciliation because they might not forgive us. It can also hinder us receiving forgiveness and receiving that reconciliation. And I, I really do think this is something that God wants to put his finger on this morning. And we're going to respond at the end, sing, uh, sing a few songs, and worship God. And there's going to be a ministry team over here. If you know that guilt is a, is a key issue that's hindering a relationship with you and that you, you, you can't be a son, you feel like a servant, and maybe this is with God, actually. And I felt, you know, the volcano has been on the news and the volcanic cloud over us. I felt some people spiritually feel that they can't be sons and that they can only be servants because of what they've done, run away from God and squandered God's grace. And actually, 
they're living under this cloud that's erupted or, or, of suffering and of sin. And they're grounded, just like the air, airways are grounded, in their relationship with God. And God wants this morning to reconcile, reconcile you. Guilt is no, no hindrance for God, as, as we will see. Forgiveness is essential to full reconciliation. Forgiveness given and forgiveness received. And finally then, and we come to an end with this, is reconciliation is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Reconciliation is fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus is the utmost reconciliation. We see in verse 10 this interesting phrase. Jacob says to, to Esau, For I have seen your face, which is like seeing the face of God, seeing your face, which is like seeing the face of God, and you have accepted me. What does that mean? Well, what's going on there? I have seen your face, Esau, and it's like seeing the face of God, and you've accepted me. What's going on? Well, in the previous chapter, Jacob had an encounter where he was wrestling with God. We, we, might, we might know that story. And uh, in, a, in, in a Jacob comes out of it, and he says this in verse 30 of the previous chapter, 32. He says, I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. And he uses the same phrase, just slightly different in the next chapter. What I think he's saying is this. He's saying, the way Esau has reacted towards me is the way I know God acted towards me. And actually, in seeing how Esau acts towards me, I'm, I'm seeing God. I'm seeing something of God. The way Esau has forgiven me, the way Esau has humbled himself, and the way Esau has come to me. Actually, it's like seeing God. You've accepted me, Esau. When I was with God, the swindler that I am, he delivered me. He's saying, what I see in Esau, I know that's what God is like. In both, there is a separation. I think that's what's going on with the father and the, and the son. Jesus tells that story to show us what God is like. In both these stories, we are meant to see, I think, something of the way Jesus treats us. And Esau towards Jacob and the father towards the son. We, we are meant to see the way that God treats us. Because ever since Adam and Eve, there's this horizontal break between relationships and this vertical break. Jacob and Esau were enemies, death threats, stealing from each other. They were enemies. And in fact, the Bible tells us that because of our wrongdoings towards God, our sin has separated us from him, like Jacob and Esau, like the father and, like the, father and the son. And just as Esau has every reason to be opposed to Jacob, and the father has every reason in the prodigal son to be opposed to the son, so God, because of what we've done, has every reason to oppose us because that relationship has been severed. Instead, however, God initiates reconciliation with us. God humbles himself, takes on the form of man. God comes and he forgives us. We read this in 2 Corinthians 5. We read in 2 Corinthians 5. It says that God, through Christ, reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. If we could have the next slide up, please. Not counting their trespasses against them. And in Romans 5, it says, while we were enemies, we were reconciled. It's a very biblical word, this. It's a theological word. Reconciled to God by the death of his son. We also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. And we come to an end with this, and we see that actually all these points are characteristic of Jesus. And I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, Emily, if you guys could just start to come up, and if Mark could pray for this. As I mentioned earlier, guilt, and I, this is a specific thing I'm going for, guilt can hinder us accepting God's forgiveness. Why? I think it's because inside of us, we know that forgiveness can feel cheap. I think it can feel cheap sometimes. I think as Jacob approached Esau, it's okay, Mark. Don't worry, Mark, it's okay. it's okay. As Jacob approached Esau, and Esau forgave him without waiting for an apology, I think Jacob thought, how can you not punish me? How can you forgive me? It's cheap, I've wronged you. Don't you need to do something? I think as the son came back to the father, father, I've messed you around. I've taken my inheritance. I've squandered it. And now I'm coming back. How can you forgive me? I think 
that guilt comes in because we, that feels cheap. Surely, surely we must pay for our wrongs. Surely there's a consequence to our actions. Surely forgiveness is not just washing over. Does God do that? Does God just sweep over our sin? Is that what forgiveness is? Does God say it doesn't matter? Is that what forgiveness is? No, I, I, I don't think so at all. I don't think that's what forgiveness is. Our wrong towards God must have consequences. And that's why Jesus died, folks. We're going to come back to worship in a moment. That's why Jesus died. The payment we should make for the wrong we've done, actually, is made. It's made by Jesus. God can't just sweep over that sin. God looks upon His Son. And if you, if you, would, if you trust in Jesus, what you're saying is, I'm the Son who's squandered everything God's ever given me, and now I'm coming back to the Father. And I feel like a servant, but I know because Jesus has paid for that wrong, I know I'm a son. Can, can we stand just as we come to an end? I want to I pray for us. This is the very reason Jesus had to die, so that he could take the penalty or the payment of the wrong we had done so that we might be reconciled to God, that we might come back to the Father. And when a Christian forgives, and this is important for application this morning, when a Christian forgives, they are not saying what you did to me doesn't matter. All right? You're not saying, oh, what you did doesn't matter. What you're saying is, I put that into the hands of God to deal with. The justice I feel I deserve, God's going to deal with that, actually. Jesus epitomizes this. Can we just close our eyes? I'd love to, love to pray. I really do. I want to, I want to lean in on you this morning and just remind us of the, the verse at the beginning, Matthew 5. If you know you are at odds with your brother, first be reconciled. Can I ex- exhort us this morning? If you know that's the case, seek out seek out the person this morning maybe maybe it's a phone call as we leave maybe it's a letter maybe it's a, it's a colleague when we get back to work Lord I, I, want, I, I pray now Lord that every situation that you would give us grace Lord that you would give us courage like Jacob and Esau humility like Jacob and Esau Lord whether we are the wronged or the wronging party Come now on us, Lord, we pray that we might be reconciled, that we might be united.